So this is going to be a relatively short video because I'm going to show you how to reference your rig into an animation file. We're going to set just the um, framework for the animation clips that you have to provide and then I'm going to leave the rest up to you. So here I've got my completed rigging file with skinning and controls and everything working. And just to go through a final check on this file, I have made sure that the controls are visible and capable of being uh, interacted with, that they're all zeroed out. The geometry is vi visible, but also incapable of being interacted with. The bones layer is turned off in visibility and set to template just in case um, it wasn't. And in the outliner, this is what it looks like. We've got a group for the geometry, we've got a group for the bones, a group for the controllers, and a group for all the stuff that we shouldn't be moving or messing with. Uh, sometimes you can put some of that stuff in here, but because at the end of this process uh, we're going to bake our animation, I just want the bones and geometry to be free. And with these two being separate like this, it just makes them easy to delete at the end of this entire process. So there's the completely set up animation file ready for referencing. So what we do is we create a new blank scene. I already actually saved this, so I'm just going to not save. So new blank scene. Okay, uh, I'm going to change my frame rate right away because it always complains about this. I put 30 frames per second in the rig file, and I'm going to put 30 frames per second here. It doesn't actually matter, but it's just something to make sure there's no mismatch. File, create reference, and then you're going to browse for your rig file. So I'm going to go to the folders that that's contained in. Go to my latest file. Okay. And here it is. So it pops into the scene. I don't know why it seems so huge. It shouldn't be huge, but there we go. So we're able to do everything with this that we could do in the uh, original file. So why would we do this? Why would we reference? Um, there's a couple of reasons. One, we can give this a local name which can effectively make it um, a unique duplicate if you want several. So let's go to the reference editor here. Um, here's our rig file. You can see it's got a checkbox for loading and unloading. Here's the namespace. So I'm just going to call this um, guy for the namespace and it'll rename everything guy colon whatever. So you could have several duplicates of this that are essentially uniquely named if you wanted. Um, I can turn this off. There's no real reason for that here, but if you imagine that you're referencing in like scenery or several characters, you might want to do that. Turn them off and on. Each time you click this back on, it's like reloading it. Okay. But here's the real benefit of referencing. I didn't fix the skinning on my fingers. There we go. You can see it's faulty. So I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to pose this down here. In fact, I'll put animation keys on it. So let's key that down here and we'll key this back at zero on frame one. So this is essentially like I've got some animation now. And imagine that you go all the way through a long animation phase and oh no, you've done something wrong with the rig. Do you have to start over entirely or try to fix that in this file? No. In fact, you can have even much worse problems in this file, and you can go back to the other file that we just referenced and fix them. Okay. Um, some rules about referenced files. I can't delete anything. It won't allow me. So I just hit the delete key. Down here we get a warning. Um, cannot delete guy hand R control as it is locked or read only children. Because this is a part of a reference, I can't delete anything like that. So I can't delete constraints. I can't... Um, delete history. I can't do any of that. All I can do is use the rig. I can't uh, fundamentally change it here. But I'm going to save this as a uh, animation file. Let's save it to the desktop and we'll say that this is our um, anim loops one. That'll be fine. Cannot. Okay, so file contains unknown node or data. I think that's because this mesh was old. So it didn't like that file type. So here's all you have to do. Change that from ASCII to binary, and then you'll be fine. So guy anim, or sorry, loops, anim loops, one. There we go. So now it's just student version warning. That's fine. All right, so now that we've got this file saved, all this file contains is a reference, 
and the changes that we make to our reference, the, the animation. So I can go back and open my rig file now. Let's just find it over here. And the one that I specifically left off on was skinning number five. So I'm going to open that. And it's just the way that we left it. But now I could come over here to this finger and I could fix the paint weights. So I'm going to stretch this upward just so that it's different from how I animated it to kind of make a point. And I'm going to get my skin cluster paint weights. Open up the tool settings. There we are. And we're going to go down. Is this the correct side? I think this is the incorrect side. Pointer. All right, there we are. So we've got pointer finger. So I'm going to go to pointer finger one. I do want the bones showing now again. There they are. Okay, and we'll switch over to select. I'm going to select the vertices of the pointer finger. And flood them to that first bone. So here's pointer one. So I'm going to replace value of one. Flood. So now only the first joint does anything. If I tried to bend this finger, it wouldn't work. And we'll go to middle thumb and key middle middle over here change select mode again grab that one come back to paint and I'll flood that one as well <clears throat> okay so flood to a value of one I probably should have expanded that a little bit but it's just an example so it's okay all right, so I'm going to exit that. And now if I grab, let's turn this back off so I can see. If I grab, turn this back to render. Oh, that's the thumb. Where did my uh, controller go? Oh, it's inside. Probably should have thought, well, I guess you're never going to bend it backwards that far. So now if I bend this, this is the way it behaves now, which, you know, equally wrong, but whoops. Um, I don't have to go back and change anything about my animation file. Whatever I did in my animation file, that's preserved the way it is. And now the function of the rig is preserved the way it is. So we can go back as soon as I zero all this out. You actually don't even need to, but it's a really good step to zero it all out. So I'm going to close these panels, make sure that my bones are off, controls shown, geometry is relocked again. Okay, so I'm going to resave this file. Now you could save a new version. If you save a new version, then you're going to have to update which version you're referencing. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll iterate and save instead. So let's increment, increment and save. So now this is six instead of five. I'm going to open my animation file again. Okay. And show that, see, this hasn't changed yet because reference editor this file right is number five now you can see unresolved name up here and you can reload uh, in order to replace this or re-reference it so we can replace reference right here once that's selected and then browse for number six and now the animation, as you can see, is still preserved. It's just that the rig functions slightly different now. That's that paint weighting is now altered to this version. Okay, so it's a really great way to preserve your work. Um, the way that that works is as long as things are named the same, then the animation will be preserved. So it's looking for a name of an object. So as long as none of the um, control names have changed. If you were, for instance, to add new controls, like the problem with your rig is that you left off a jaw control entirely. There was no jaw control. It would still work. It's just that the jaw control once put into your animation file wouldn't have any animation on it because you couldn't have animated something that didn't exist. Uh, if you animate things that don't belong, so for instance, if this doesn't belong and you go back to your rig file and you delete it, it would still work. It's just that the animation for that would be lost because there's no more um, controller with that name. Okay, so referencing is a really, really great way to work. At the end of this whole process, 
we're going to have to import the reference. So once you do all the animation steps, you can come in here and then right click file import objects from reference. That is a permanent change though. So you can't undo that. You can't go back to being a reference once you've brought them into this file. It would essentially just copy it over and then everything's completely editable. Um, we're gonna do that so that we can tear the rig apart and bake it down just to its bones and mesh, which is a, a great way to ensure that everything comes over into Unity perfectly. You don't need to do that to import into Unity, but it's a good thing to know how to do. So we'll do that at the very, very end. Okay. So there's a little rundown on how to reference to get this file um, set up in the first place. And now I'm going to run you guys through um, how to set up the animation loops that we're going to need for importing into Unity. All right, so what are the loops that we have to do? I've got them written on a little notepad document here. We need an idle walk run, jump up pose, mid-air pose, or this one could be a cycle if you had mechanics in your game, such as like fans that blow you up into the air repeatedly or you float. Jump down cycle. That one is the only one of the three of these, but it's good to have a cycle regularly because it's very likely that you can fall more than just a couple feet. And then an upper body action, which we're going to use to blend with the other cycles so that we can perform an action with our character. And what I've got written here are the um, frame rate or the frame durations and then the frame number that each one of those starts on. So we start the idle on frame one. Uh, you could offset this stuff, by the way, to preserve a T-pose for some reason. I'm not quite sure why you would do it, but I've seen some animators do that. Maybe there's some technical reason, I don't know. So I'm gonna start the idle on frame one. Uh, 60 frames is longer than typical because an idle could play for quite a long time. So you could have more subtle action in it. Um, a walk that takes one second. Um, so it will start at 60 one frames in and then last until 90. Then we've got run starting at 91. So we add 30. Um, we've got uh, jump up starting at 101, jump mid starting at 111, jump down starting at 121, and then upper body action starting at 151 and lasting 30 frames to end at 180. So just this is a helpful thing to um, help me place everything on the timeline because that's one of the first bits of structure that we want to think about with our um, file because we want to have all these cycles in one file so that we can break them up in Unity and so that we know that they are absolutely compatible with the same rig. Uh, you can do these in separate files, but you run the risk that you introduce incompatibility because something gets renamed or shuffled around somehow or broken. Uh, I find that it is safest to do all of these in a single continuous file like this uh, because the import process works better. But I will say for larger projects where you've got many more cycles than this, um, it is completely reasonable to break them up into separate files instead. So I'm going to move this aside and I'm going to use that to follow along to place all of my primary keyframes in the correct position. We've got enough frames here on the timeline to accommodate everything. I'm just going to scoot that out to 180 total and take a look in my animation preferences. So um, you just hit the little running man down there if you don't remember. Playback speed, we want to make sure that that is set to one times, not play every frame so that it plays accurately. Uh, we want to have our frame rate at 30 frames per second. Make sure you have enough frames visible here. In our sorry, animation section, I always like to make sure that weighted tangents is the default and auto. And then I auto key is down here, but auto key is what I typically use. So there we have all of the settings that we need to begin. And I'm gonna just start by grabbing every controller on the entire character and putting in my keyframes along the timeline where each of my cycles begins and ends. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this one. Uh, by the way, if I've never mentioned it before, how to delete, I think I have, but hold down shift, left click and drag to drag a selection on your timeline. And then you can right click anywhere in that selection to delete, copy, paste, cut, whatever. So I'm going to delete out of there. Um, you can also, by the way, move that selection with that center icon. The side ones scale, and I recommend that you don't do that because it moves them off of whole frame numbers. But I'm going to go ahead and delete all of that. And there we go, we're starting fresh. So I'm going to put a keyframe on every controller right at the start of the timeline for my idle. Then I'm going to go to 60, 
which is the end of the idle cycle. And I'm going to hit um, S for keyframe. 61 is the start of my next cycle. That would be the walk cycle. So I'm going to hit S again. And then we're going to go up to 90, which is where the walk ends. 91, which is where the uh, run begins. Then 30, I think I did, yeah, I did my math wrong. So we got to add 30 to that. Um, so we've got 10, 20, 30, 120. And then 121 is where the next one would begin. So let me fix that real quick because I just realized it. So the run cycle here needs to go until 121. That means this is 31. This one starts at 41. And then we add 30 to that to start at 71. And then it lasts 30 until 200. So, I mean, another reason to do this this is also, I, if you want to do this, like write it in a little notepad, this will help you later on because once we get into Unity and we're setting up those um, clips, you need to know the frame range for those clips. And it would be helpful to have like a name that you could copy paste as well. So this has more than one utility. So I'm going to put that back over there. Um, so now I'm going to 130 and we're going to hit S, 131 to start the next one. You can see I'm bookending these clips with two keyframes because it's going to go right from one state to another. In some cases, I'll show you that that's not necessary if they're going to like transition. But in this case, it's it's going to be a hard rule, I think. So we're going to go to 140 and then 141 is the next clip. Then finally, 170. We're going to extend this out to 200. Just like that. And 171 is the start of our last clip and 200 is the end of all of them. So now we've got these little bookended sections that we can uh, put our animation into. Just a, a nice way to kind of organize the timeline just for a start. And I'm gonna save that, okay? So let's do just our primary posing for each of these. Um, an idle cycle is where we're gonna start off with. And the the big thing I'll note about an idle cycle is that it is not just put the arms down. Okay, that is a part of it, sure. But you want to look like this character is ready to move, potentially. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, the hand twists as I put it down because of the elbow. But that's okay. So we'll put the, the arm down at his side. Now, I would relax the, the fingers, but as you know that my paint weights are not great on those fingers. And so he's just going to have platter hands for this demonstration. But really, we're just getting in, like I said, the structure of these various cycles. And I'm going to leave the detail work up to you. I'm going to go ahead and move the elbows back behind his body. Probably actually leave them a little further out. But yeah, we don't want him to look like this. This is a very awkward, stilted pose. It's almost like he's a gunslinger or something like that. You want to think a little bit more about it. Um, he should look like he's preparing to walk. So first, I almost always drop the root just a little bit on these um, poses so that we get a bit of subtlety in the legs. And I'm going to rotate the feet out just a little bit and slide them towards the center a little bit like this. We could even do things like um, slide the feet forward and backward if we know which leg is going to take a step first. So I think I'll step for, forward with the right leg first. I'm going to slide that back a little bit and this one forward so that this one will progress forward as the very first thing that happens. I'm actually going to rotate that a little bit further out. Just trying to get it a little bit more natural. Okay. So we can mess around with dropping the, the root a little bit. The only thing I do try to do for the start and end of the idle is leave the, the root centered over the grid. Um, height is one thing, but moving it around to a, a different position is kind of another. Um, since we're going to have a character controlled by physics and in the middle of a collider capsule, I don't want to move the rig too much, especially in the default portion. So we'll just do something like that. Let's look at his posture and see if I can do something about that. So I might move it forward just a little bit, bring his neck up and his head up just a tiny bit. 
just so it looks like he's kind of preparing to go somewhere. His neck is very, very forward. I don't really like that. There we go. Something like this, maybe. And I'm going to give his arms just a little bit of asymmetry. So this hand, I'm going to put back a little bit, sort of countering the upper body. And it would maybe be a good idea to rotate uh, his shoulders just a little bit compared to his legs. We could even shrug or move these off of the zero location. I think I'd actually move this back and then move his hand forward just a tiny bit like this. So like he's going to be preparing to walk or move or something. I think a bird just flew into my house. Not into my house, but into the side of my house outside. I heard a crash and saw a flutter. Oh, well, that was fun. <laughs> All right, so just kind of doing something other than the defaults, kind of messing all these values up a little bit so that they're not going to seem robotic. Um, it's very easy to make a 3D character seem robotic by leaving things in their kind of default positions. And so loosening that stuff up can be a great step. Um, I definitely, I hate the hands, of course, but I would want to like make these cup and feel like they're a little bit more natural with the use of bends. I'll go ahead and put the, the bend in there, at least on all the fingers to start off with. That way, when I fix the skinning, then that will look nice again. So I'll at least do that and put some bend in the thumbs as well. Typically, the thumbs are going to look the worst, and so you may have to rotate and move them kind of like this. I tend to maybe not bend them quite as much, something like that. Okay, and you know they look really weird, but whatever. Um, we could also even do stuff with the eyes or with the head. Um, thinking forward, this character is just going to be moving and walking pretty much straight ahead. I'm going to lower the gaze just a bit towards like the ground and move it out. And something I often like to do, if the character is going to look a great distance away, leave the eyes looking straight forward. If they're going to be looking a little bit closer to them, you can move these in just a tiny bit and it gives them a kind of nearby focus, but don't do it too much. It's really hard to see on that character, but I think I've see it's just enough that he's looking at something like on a nearby table or something right now. But for some reason, my controller was way off to this side and I don't remember doing that. So I'm going to move it back to center again. There we go. So he's just kind of looking at the nearby ground. I may have lowered it just a little too much. Yeah, right about there. It's just slightly down and slightly in. Um, we could do something to his jaw just so that it's not in this perfect default state. <laughs> So I'm going to mess it up and then just close his mouth. And you can even get the, the appearance of like lip pressing a little bit if it's a little off center and a little higher than it was. Okay. And anything I want to do with the neck to bring it off center. Yeah, I could tilt it just a little bit like this, just so that it's not like completely perfect. Anything that you can do to make it less mirrored and perfect is going to um, add to the, to the feeling of life in that character. So since we've got the basics under our belt now, we want to start doing things that are a bit more lively, a bit more lifelike. So even having his, his hand touching his leg a little tiny bit like that, not a super bad thing. I think I can slacken that one just a bit more. There we go. He's starting to look a little bit more like a human. I'm going to, let's see. Okay, so I leaned his upper body off that way. I feel like his shoulders are really low. So I'm going to raise those just a little. There we go. And I'm going to just offset his waist a tiny bit. And I already offset his feet. So at least this guy looks like he's waiting around or something like that. I'll go ahead and also um, rotate him back to the left just a little so we have a bend in the body, but he's not 
overall leaning to the side. So at least he looks like he's active and thinking and not just a mannequin. Okay. So there we go. That's a first nice posing pass. So I did all of that on keyframe one. If you don't have auto key on, you have to hit S before you move, but I do. So I could hit it because I'm paranoid, but I don't have to. I would copy this by shift and left clicking to get our selection and then right click, copy and paste it on this last keyframe for the idle. So right click, paste. So we've got a bookended pose now that just holds for that entire time. We'll worry about the nature of that internal animation after we get these initial poses, but this would at least make it um, possible for me to import it in Unity to test and to check that the, the rig isn't going to explode or the mesh isn't going to turn inside out or it's going to render properly. Because once I have the time frame for the, for the animation cycle, and I've got the pose, then my character controller could respond to that. So it would stand still like a statue. And then as you'll see, when we make our walk and run, he would hold those poses like a statue, but they would be the correct poses. So let's go ahead and do the walk uh, pose then. I like to, if I'm going from two different cycles that are gonna transition, I like to paste that starting pose first and start from it, because this is likely what's going to blend into and out of the walk. So now I've got on 60, this pose, and at 61, I'm just starting from there so that I can plan out what I'm gonna do, okay? So I'm gonna take that step forward with the right foot, like I said, so I'm gonna move that forward. I'm gonna rotate it up so that we're making contact. And for the back foot, I am going to rotate, or sorry, move it backward, and then do ball roll like that. And we're going to try to figure out what is the, the distance that we should do for a walk, not a run. Probably something like this, and I might bring that down a little bit. Okay. Something like that. Now, remember, in this case, what we rigged, we don't have a heel roll control. And so we do have to rotate it up, unlike the last one that we did. Um, I'm going to probably drop the root just a tiny bit more. And then make sure that unlike my standing position, my steps are taking place more on a center line like that. Okay. Um, let's see. Is that far enough? For a walk, I think that's far enough. There's a slight bend in the legs. They're straight enough, really. They don't look strange. So I'm okay with that. I am going to lean the root forward. This is a really important thing a lot of um, beginner animators miss, that your body has to be falling forward, essentially, to walk or to run. The faster you're moving, the more lean you need. So be sure not to skip that. Now, we do counter it oftentimes by rotating back upward again. Or you could even rotate further down and then use the head just to get like the, the shoulders leading or the... Or the um, the head leading, but if you want your chest to lead, then you would go back like this. This is like a confident or heroic sort of thing. Uh, I'm gonna lean the, the body forward a little bit further and then bring the neck back a tiny bit and bring the head up. So he's like leading with his head. Let's see, can I bring that back further so it's not so goofy? Now he's like leading with the Adam's apple or, or leading with the, the upper chest or something like that. Um, it's a little geeky. Yeah, that's okay. It doesn't make him look strong or heroic, but it's a reasonable walking pose anyway. Um, we're also going to use our rotation here to bring the forward hip forward. And I am using the root so that the entire thing rotates so that I have to um, counter rotate the upper body. So let's grab those. I'm going to counter rotate to bring this shoulder forward and bend him back up to neutral. Okay. So this hand will be the forward hand somewhere out there. This one will be the back hand because they oppose the legs. Somewhere back there, we'll worry about the details in a little bit. 
and then I'm going to re-center the neck and the head. I personally try not to rotate the neck too much. Instead, I like to rotate just the skull, but you could do both. Okay, now taking a look at the pose. So let's get his hand in the right basic kind of position. And bring it a little bit further in, a little bit further up. Get the elbow out. Angle the hand further in towards the center of the body. Let's drop it just a little bit. So something more like that. And probably the fingers wouldn't be open like that. They'd be a bit more closed. But the paint weights make it tough to tell on that. And then finally, I could push the shoulder forward just a little bit. It gives me a bit more room and gets the shoulders active. Mm, that's fine. We'll say that's okay. It looks a little bit like Bigfoot, but okay. Let's bring this shoulder backward, this hand up and back a bit. A little further away from the body. In the case of swinging backward, you don't go to the center line because it's um, uncomfortable. Just try it. Swing your arm, you know, around your front. It's easy. Swing it around their back. It's awkward and it hurts a little bit. But I think that that angle's okay. He definitely looks like Bigfoot now. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that. Um, I'm going to drop this just a little bit. I think it's his posture. The fact that I had him lean forward, it makes him look either aggressive, determined, or ungainly but it's fine. Um, I don't know why my eyes keep going off center like this. Oh, it's because I leaned the body over. Now I remember. Let's bring it back center. Something I can do for myself just for the future is just slide this further away so it stays more neutral overall. And uh, we can do that with the knees as well. So they'll stay a little bit more neutral. The elbows, though, need to be nearby to be active. Um, rather than fiddle with this endlessly, we'll just say this is fine for a walk pose. So I'll just grab everything one more time and hit S. And now we've got the difference between neutral and walking one frame apart. And again, I'm going to copy that pose and I'm going to place it on the last frame. Paste. Uh, if we wanted to do just a little bit more detail before moving on to the next one, we would do the opposite pose, which would be halfway with all of this reverse. But let's skip it and move on to the run cycle. So again, because a run transitions from the walk, I paste the walking pose first because the run is just an exaggerated version of this. The same leg we want to be leading, but now it's leading as if we're taking big strides. I want the same leg to be behind. I want this arms to be doing the same thing because it's just a wider, more energetic version of the same action. So first thing here, I'm going to drop the root more and lean the body further forward because those are things that are going to need to happen to make it look like we've got more speed. I'm going to, so here's an interesting thing. I could do the, the contact pose for the run, or I could do one where the leg is essentially up, uh, but I think I'm going to do a contact pose because I just want to control where the foot hits the ground. I'm going to rotate this higher, move them further apart. In a run, your gait um, the distance between your legs will lengthen pretty significantly. So I'm going to move this back. But if your front foot is on the ground in a run, it means your back foot is up in the air. You don't oftentimes have um, both feet contacting the ground at the same time in a run. It's sort of a leaping action. So I'm going to turn the ball roll off and lift up the back foot. It's going to look pretty weird as you rotate it around, but just get there. And... There we go. So this is this is more like he just pushed off with that back foot and is just contacting the ground for the first time with the front leg. Okay, so that will be our basic leg position. Yep, they're on a pretty good central line here. We could rotate the hips more to accommodate for the greater action in the body. I'm going to grab the upper body. At this point, you would either lean it way over or you would start to reverse it. Um, I'm going to reverse it a little bit. 
and that means that I'm going to lean the body a bit further, kind of like that. I'm going to jut the neck forward and raise the chin up. Okay, uh, everything but the arms, I feel okay about that. Then the arms have a wider and more exaggerated uh, action as well. At this point, I would probably bring the hand in and up and across, there we go, starting to get the right look, and across the body more, and definitely raise up the elbows. To raise up the elbows, bring them closer to the line of action, like this. We can move them further away from the center line if you want more leeway, but the closer you are, the greater the difference will be. So I like to keep them like around here, and we're going to raise up this shoulder, bring it forward, there you go. It starts to look a little bit more athletic. Okay, something like something like that. And then for the rear shoulder, I'm going to rotate it back and probably up a little bit also. Take the hand and bring it way up. Now the elbow looks terrible got to bring it back in line like this. There we go. Gonna move it a little bit further away. That's not bad. I think I went a little too far. There we go. That's that's a bit more reasonable. And then actually that position for that backhand doesn't look half bad. Okay. I mean overall for a, a first pass on that, I think I did okay. Uh, let me see if there's something I need to do with the hips. I think the butt was just sticking out, sticking out a little bit too much. I could correct that by rotating this back up and reducing the amount of, of body, or I could get the hips in there and just rotate them forward a little bit. Um, oh, I forgot to increase the amount of swivel. No, I did that. I did that. All right, well, let's not you know, agonize over, over this. That's a decent enough running pose for our purposes. Everything should already be keyed, but I'm just going to grab it all again. Hit S. Copy by hitting Shift, left click. Right click, copy, left click, and right click, paste, just like that. And you can test it by doing period and comma. If you click and drag, nothing should move until the moment it changes. If things are wandering around, then you'll have to go into your graph editor and set them back to default um, splines or to linear uh, spl li linear tangents if you want to. So there we go, there's the run. So I'm gonna just click the save key and just in case something bad happens, good habit to have. So our next one is the jump up. And um, to remind you, this is not necessarily um, in a squat, like preparing to jump. This is the, I have just left the ground pose. And it is just a pose. The reason I've got 10 frames here is to aid in the blending between them so that there's some time to play. I found at one point that if I made a single frame clip that Unity treated that a little unpredictably. So now even if I have a single pose, I give it just 10 frames just in case there's some sort of glitch or problem. Um, for this one, we could start with the running pose if we wanted to and lead with the same leg. I guess I don't see why not, um, given that this is going to be a fairly dynamic thing, but it's not as important this time that we start from this same pose. So I'm going to go ahead and just paste it anyway, but just know that that's not really necessary. Uh, let's bring the back foot back onto the ground, though. I'm going to completely zero it so that I can use toe roll to bring us up into a jumping position like that. I'm trying to think, do I really want to do this? In the back of most of our steps, toe roll is going to be active. Actually, I don't. I don't. I'm going to, I'm going to just rotate the, the foot. I think it'll be okay because we're off the ground. And the front leg, I'm going to probably also angle it downward but less, something like that. Let's go ahead and lift our root upward. 
And again, I'm trying not to move the, the root forward and backward for any of these so that the position of the body is determined by the um, simulation in Unity. So if I want to give him forward um, velocity, then I move both the legs back instead. So you can see that back leg is starting to look nicer. The front leg, maybe not so much yet. I'm going to reduce the amount of forward lean a little bit. I don't really want side to side lean on this. There we go. And I think the body arc is feeling OK. This would be reaching upward toward the sky. We're pushing upward, so it would be something like that. Um, actually, that felt a bit better. Yeah, that felt a little bit better. So I'm going to move the, the leg forward just until this back one straightens. So I want a nice, strong line of action there. Oh, I moved the, the root forward just like I said I wouldn't. So let's move that back instead. Uh, try not to hyperextend. You'll notice you know, when you hyperextend, the leg starts to look really goofy. So I want it right there. And so I'm going to lower the body and the leg just until that toe touches the ground. So we might glimpse just a moment of contact when this hits, or maybe not, but it'll it'll help the transition. So this leg, I'm going to, let's see, widen the knee just a little bit. I'm also going to get this off that, that level. This, and I'm going to actually slide the pushing leg towards the center also. Let's see, where's the knee? I think the knee, the knee's fine. All right, so we're also going to bring the neck up a bit further. And you don't have to make the face look upward like this. Uh, in fact, I might recommend having the chin down because there's a sort of overlap uh, that will occur where because you're pushing, propelling yourself up your face, your head, will try to drag back down. So you might drag this down. You might look up. Depends on how active you want the character to feel and how passive. So we could do something like this, where he's jumping over something on the ground. Or you could have him looking upward like he's jumping up to reach something. It's kind of up to the sort of game that you're going to do or the kind of action that you want to perform. I think um, in this case, looking at it, I like a slightly up nose rather than a slightly down, but not not very much. I'm not going to make him look straight up like he's he's doing some gymnastics or something like that. Um, the eyes is another question. Um, in the jump, I tend to put the eyes a little above the character for the push off. For the mid, I put them a little bit um, down. For the landing, I put them very down, like towards the ground. But it's a small detail. It's unlikely people are going to notice that. The arms. The arms are a weird one because um, when you think about it, like for jumping, you're probably going to lift your arm, at least one of them up, kind of like a Mario thing. But I found that if you're making single poses and blending them, having both the arms lower for the push off and both the arms higher for the, the falling creates a really pleasing overlap uh, animation effect. And so I'm going to leave both arms lower down almost an exaggerated lower down, kind of like this, just so I can get that effect later on. So I'm still going to try to oppose the body. So this is the front leg, uh, the forward leg. This is the rear leg. So I'm going to bring this uh, closer to the body and more straight down. And same thing here. I'm going to bring this closer to the body and more straight down. Bring this elbow a bit closer. Just because it's going to create a, a good effect. Um, for the shoulders, I'm actually going to lower them. So we get a feeling of pushing upward towards the sky instead. And I'm straightening the arms quite a bit, but they're going to bend again on the midair pose, so it should feel OK.
This arm I don't really like very much. I think it's because of the amount of twist in the body I've got. Let's untwist that a little. Maybe I went too far with the shoulder. Maybe it's just bad paint waiting, and I have to go back and fix that. It's probably just bad paint waiting. Yeah, I think it's bad paint waiting. I'm looking at like this part of the character I've never liked, and now I'm liking it much, much less. It looks really weird. But uh, regardless, we'll, we'll move on. So I'm going to recenter his head. There we go. And just take a look. Yeah, I'm just not. I'm kind of not a fan of the model, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, not my department. <laughs> Didn't make this. All right. I'll move it a little further forward, but low. All right, that, that'll be fine. So we've got the arms low so that when he's traveling up, they're dragging behind. When he hits the midair, they'll catch up. And when he's heading back down, they'll fly up in the air and it will create almost like he has a tail on him. So it'll be pleasing. Let's grab all those and shift left click and then copy. And then on the last frame of that cycle, paste. Okay. Again, probably we just want to click save just in case go to the next one. This is one I will definitely paste the same pose again because it is transitioning from this to midair. Um, so the idea here is that we are weightless in air. So I tend to, for the um, jump, lean the whole body forward. For the landing, lean the whole body back, right? And so for this one, we're going to lean the body neutral, essentially, like have it doing the trade-off position. So I'm going to curl the body in on itself a bit like this. And the red leg, I'm having lead all of these actions also. So it is up in the air for pushing off. Um, and then for landing, it's going to be the one that's contacting because on our walks, we had it contacting. So that means uh, this one would have met the neutral position first and then started to travel down. So I'm just going to angle it like this. And this one would still be kind of traveling up like that. But now it's sort of catching up with the body. So it's going to be more neutral, a little bit less angled, but more in the middle. And this one's a bit like we're extending the heel down towards the ground or will soon enough. Let me bring the neck and head back into alignment. So I'm going to bring it back to neutral and get it a little bit more. That's, that's okay. Like it, we're kind of squeezing the body in for this neutral pose. And then the big thing is that we want the arms to kind of be suspended out on the sides of the body. And then they're going to flip upward as we start traveling down again. So I'm going to bring the, the shoulders back up. I guess you could look at um, stills or footage of people jumping on trampolines to get this idea, but that midair position. Uh, elbows are going to tend to be a little bit higher and away from the body for this one, just for a moment. And by the way, the flipping of the arms is something you want to be careful about. Um, take Be careful about the path that you take. We want to go this way right not that way because then they'll flip inside out um but that's starting to look okay let's see a little further forward there that's that's better and then for this one let's get the elbow higher there we go and a little further away from the body shoulder a bit higher back oh, i was a little back i think maybe a little too high
No, I think it'll it'll work out. So you can see that the hands are still sort of dragging down a bit, but then they're going to flip upward. You can kind of imagine that. Uh, all right, good enough for our purposes. Let me grab every controller and copy and paste. And we'll paste again. So that I've got, there's my two upward, my two mid, and then this one actually would be a cycle. It would be, we're now traveling downward. So this is going to be the leading foot. So it is going to extend down towards the ground more. And I like to exaggerate the, the bend as well. Like we're going to land heel first. I don't know why my, my foot looks so, so cockeyed. Am I outside the range? Hmm. I'm going to really quickly just zero that. Oh, I think it was the, yeah, it's the knee's fault. All right, let me undo that. Bring it back. Yeah, it, it looked really strange because of the way the knee was out there. Hmm. Controller's still a little bit crooked. I might have done something weird this time, but it is working, so we'll just leave it. All right, and then this one we'll have tucked in, and it's beginning to, to take on the, the forward bend like it's going to land also. So kind of like that. So both feet are sort of in front of the body. Okay, so both feet sort of behind or neutral, then both feet sort of neutral, and then both feet kind of in front of the body when we land. And in this one, I'm going to lean the body back and also straighten the spine a bit. Not too much. We do still want a forward bend, but I'm just straightening it a bit. Bring that neck up and the head chin down so that we're looking down towards the ground. There we go. It feels a bit more like a, a landing. And again, try not to move off neutral with the, the root at least. Okay, cool. Let's see what sort of rotation we've got here. So we're leading with that side. This one, I probably should have brought it back to the center. That one, well, it's okay. All right, and now we're going to try to flip the hands upward. So I'm going to move them up here, right? And then I want to rotate this direction, right? Now the hand just flipped inside out there. Don't be concerned about that. Move the elbow beyond that center line and it should flip back. Uh-oh. Wow, that's really messed up. So yeah, there could be something, oof. There could be something I did wrong here, but it seems to want to do this and I'm a little concerned about that honestly so here's something I could do if I think that's a problem okay I'm gonna grab all of these keys and I'm going to select and move this away so that it could transition now I know where to put it back right at 141 but I'm gonna scrub between those positions and watch that hand because that was a, a concerning flip yeah, okay, so see the way that it's going? It's taking an outward arc to flip upward. That's a problem. And so what I might have is gimbal lock or what I might have is a badly constructed controller. If it's a badly constructed controller, I don't know what to tell you because um, this is the way I've done it before and I'm not sure what the issue is. I could very carefully control the elbow or I could counter rotate the controller itself. There is the, the fact that I rotated to correct that along X, which maybe if I just don't do it, no, it behaves worse. Okay, so let's rotate it further and see if it behaves better. Not especially. Ugh. I think this is a gimbal lock thing. Let's see if I can determine that. Okay, so here's what all of the um, keys look like. Now notice 
Most of them appear stepped. They're not really stepped. It's just because we have two keyframes side by side. But this should be the transition between the previous and the next one. It's right where we are between um, these two poses. And so let's look at just the rotates. They're the ones we're concerned with. And I do see a rather big rotation here, but X and Y don't really look like they're doing anything bad. I'm going to grab this section, go to Curves, Euler Filter, and let's see if it moves. It didn't move, so it's, it's saying there's not really an Euler problem. There's not a, a gimbal lock problem, but it sure is ugly. In our transition in Unity, that's when this will happen not within our animation poses. We're never, never going to see this in our animation poses. So for that reason, I'm a little concerned about it. Yeah, I, it's not great. wonder if there's a way for me to affect this for the better. So maybe if I move this, oh, you know what? Yeah, it did. It inwardly angled the palm when I did that. So now I would, I can, rotate this back outward again Let's see if that did anything now it still looks pretty bad well i think we'll just have to in this case kind of deal with it because i believe it's the way that the rig is set up i'd have to think a little bit more about how i'm controlling the wrist angle maybe more absolutely control that final joint and let the the forearm joint rotate procedurally but that's a, a situation that I don't want to deal with in this first rig. If you eliminated that forearm uh, bone, this would be a whole lot easier to control because you could just absolutely set it to wherever the controller says to go. It breaks a little bit visually, but then it's your responsibility to fix and you don't get these gimbal lock problems. Since we distributed the rotation down the forearm, that's why we're getting this gimbal lock problem because we can't as absolutely control that position. And I don't really remember how to fix that offhand. So sorry, but it's a good thing to know. And the simpler setup, more like the feet, or sorry, more like the ankle at least, is much easier to figure out anyway. So I'm still glad that we did it, even though it's causing this kind of headache. Okay. And let's raise up this one as well. We want to go this way. But yeah, you can see it starts to flip when we make the wrist upward. If I bring this down, does it unflip? So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that hand backwards and just see. It doesn't really do a better job. It just goes to the right, as opposed to outside. So now if I rotate this this way, how very strange. I really think that that's a gimbal lock problem, but I wish I could prove it. It's possible that it's where this uh, elbow is in the middle of that transition so that maybe if this elbow is more down here, then we don't get that problem. Let's see, where is it going to even out? more outward like that. That's strange. Well, nothing really for it. I mean, we've got two poses. Uh, maybe when we bake animation and there are just absolute joint positions, we won't get a bad transition in the middle of our simulated uh, uh, transition, but I don't really know. So I'm just going to do what visually looks right and then see what Unity ends up doing with it. Move that a little further forward. Uh, high shoulders is a good idea here, almost like a cringe, okay. kind of like that. And you can actually set these pretty high up if you want to. You can raise them up with bent elbows like that, but you could also do this where his arms are dragging through the air or even very, very high up, but it makes him appear more passive, like he's a rag doll and doesn't have control over his fall. The tighter into the body you do it, the more it's like he's doing this intentionally um, even though there's a bit of physics acting on them. I would put the um, blue arm further forward. 
or I'm sorry, not the blue arm, the, the red arm further forward. Wait. No, yeah, it was the blue. I'm, I'm confusing the feet because the red is leading. So the blue arm would be uh, forward and the red arm would be further back. Just getting confused on that. And in that case, what that means is a little bit lower. Rather than higher. It's a little bit more like this. Right where this one is up in the air. Um, also, I'm probably at this point going to unbend the fingers, right? Like that, lift them up and then you might even splay out the fingertips and stuff. That would be just rotating them. Okay. All right, good enough. Then I'm going to grab all of those. Now remember, I did slide those away. So I'm going to slide them back to 41. Then I'm going to copy and I'm going to paste. Okay, so we have our book ended position. And then because the graph editor was looking weird, I'm just going to take one peek in there and make sure that I set them all back to defaults. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, he's just popping from position to position. That's okay. And then our final one uh, down here, this is the one that's completely up to you, um, an upper body action. So all I want you to do is don't touch the lower body. In fact, why don't we copy our idle pose? So copy and let's paste our idle pose just for a start and an end. But this action should take place only above the waist. So don't touch the um, root or the um, hips. Everything else above the, the body is fair play. So you could have him reach up and scratch his head. You could have him point straight forward. You could have him wave his arm in a friendly way. You could have him clap his hands in front of his face, whatever. Just something that doesn't affect the lower body. The idea is we'll have a button press that can trigger that, but the character could be standing, walking, running, or jumping and perform this action. And it will override whatever the upper body was doing in that case, and it will um, perform that action. So for that purpose, I would recommend, first, don't touch the root at all, but don't do very much to the chest either. Okay, chest neck and head is okay jaws okay shoulders and arms are absolutely in play but if we want to blend more with the the chest such as our um, jumping down up and stuff like that then we should try to just center this on the on the arms you should also probably start and end this one in a neutral pose like this so that we can um, transition in and out of it more seamlessly but I'm not sure that's necessary. So doing from this to clapping to back down, something like that. So in the middle here, I'm going to pose the arms doing something. Let's say, I don't really want to clap. I'll have him, uh, I'll have him do. I'll have him point forward. Fingers aren't great on this guy, but I'll lift this up. And forward. Tuck in these three fingers, which we're not really going to see because, you know, bad skinning and all. <laughs> And I'll point this one. Let's tuck in the thumb. And you, of course, would want to get in there with detail and check everything out, but I'm just going to generally do it. 
Yeah, I, I really hate that risk control, I gotta say. I need to figure out what I did wrong. Okay, and I'd probably allow for a little bit of bend in that finger, but the skinning is not gonna allow it, so. We can't see it, but he's gonna point forward like that. For this other hand, I think I would just kind of raise it up and uh, place it into kind of a fist, almost in the hip area. Let me move this away just a slight bit so I can see those fingers. So I'll just bunch these up. Maybe not all the way. And I want to keep the thumb on the outside of the fingers. Like that. It's kind of doing an okay sign right now. Ideally, those other fingers would close. All right, so I'm going to push that back in. Just have him do a sort of, uh, let's see, this towards the, the hip kind of thing. So I'll swivel this back. And yeah, just kind of keep the elbow out towards the side of the body a bit. Should I do anything with the head and neck? Yeah. Let's jet the neck forward just a little bit and raise the... And let's let's keep the head lower like that. So he's kind of like, you there, stop that. So I'm going to just hit S on everything. So he goes from that to there and back again. We'd absolutely perform some sort of better action there and think about it, but have it last about one second. Uh, you could actually make it longer if you want to. It's, it's down to you for this action. So I've got one second's worth of frames uh, blocked out here, but if you wanted a two second clip, then that's fine with me. Okay, and then it returns back to neutral. So with that, we've basically got the entire um, structure of these loops set. And if we encountered rig problems, then we know what we can do. We save this, go back to the rig, fix those problems, come back in here and our animation should be preserved the way that we've set it. And now all there's left to do is to elaborate all of these actions so that they actually perform correctly. Remember that the idle should be relatively stable without a whole lot of uh, mugging or doing broad character action. The walk, we did one of those already, so you should have a handle on that. The run is very similar to the walk, except you don't have both contacts uh, feet on the ground you have one in the air. And I think I'll provide a chart for that. Um, I think I have an animation chart for it. Then these are just poses. And I talked extensively about that, so I think we're good. And then this one is sort of up to you. Try to relegate it to the upper body only. Okay? Once you guys have all of that stuff complete, we'll do the other steps uh, next week where we export this to Unity, we hook it up with the character controller, and then we're completely done and we're ready to move on to something else. But it is a sort of uh, rewarding thing to see your animation clips play on top of something interactable. It's one of those magic moments where it feels like it comes alive. So do a good job and it will reward you. All right. If you have any questions, send me a message. Thank you guys for listening and I will see you next week.